You're watching the news on Bahrain International. I'm Hamid Shaban. Good evening. Labor and Social Development Minister Jamil bin Mohammed Ali Hamidan met today with the Executive Council Chairman of the Bahrain Free Labor Unions Federation, Al Hurra, Yaqub Yusuf Mohammed, with whom he agreed on the need for all parties to continue their efforts to support and ensure the stability of Bahraini workers. The minister stressed that enhancing cooperation among the three production parties during the exceptional circumstances witnessed by the Kingdom and the world as a result of the outbreak of the novel coronavirus COVID 19 will contribute to maintaining the professional stability of the national workforce at the labor market and ensure the sustainability of production at the private sector institutions. Yaqub Yusuf reviewed Al Hurra's efforts to highlight Bahrain's experience in fighting COVID-19 at the Arab Labor Organization, including the stimulus package provided by the government to the private sector to maintain the stability of the labor market. He said that the participants in the recent virtual meeting of the Arab Labor Organization had expressed their admiration for the Kingdom's efforts to mitigate COVID-19 impacts. The minister lauded the role played by Al Hurra to support the stability of the national work force, underlining the Labor Ministry's keenness on the stability of Bahraini workers through its constant contacts with the management of the private sector institutions. He indicated that the number of layoffs is still limited and that cooperation among the three production parties contributes to strengthening the stability of the labor market, adding that the Bahraini labor market is still generating job opportunities for Bahrainis despite the current circumstances. al Har chairman lauded the efforts exerted by the Labor Minister to maintain the stability of the Bahraini workforce, praising its policy based on activating social dialogue to address the challenges faced by the labor market. The Minister of Information Affairs, Ali bin Mohammed al-Ramehi, has affirmed that the solid relations between Bahrain and Egypt under the leadership of His Majesty King Hamad bin Isa al-Khalifa and President Abdel Fattah al-Sisi are the fruitful outcomes of the two countries' deep-rooted civilizations and the long history of mutual respect between the two brotherly people. In a televised interview over the phone with anchor Amr Adib on NBC Masr, the minister stressed the kingdom's firm stance in support of Egypt, just as Cairo's position have been always with Bahrain. He added that Egypt has always been and still is a leader in defending the Arab world and providing support to its brothers in education, medicine and culture. On the Kingdom's solidarity with Egypt regarding its efforts to preserve its national security in the midst of the ongoing developments in Libya, Aramehi stressed that Bahrain's supportive stance stems from the long-standing relations between the two brotherly countries. He asserted that Egypt's wise policy over the past years will not be affected by those conspiring against their countries or those who are connected to the Arab world only by name but serve external agenda. In this regard, the minister said that the media conspiracy launched by the Qatari Al Jazeera channel over the past 25 years for the sake of undermining Egypt's security weight has failed and Egypt still represents, as it has always been, the strategic depth and security weight of every Arab citizen. Aramehi said that the terrorist attacks and media campaigns targeting Egypt's national security are not new, adding that whoever seeks to undermine the Arab world targets Egypt and Saudi Arabia, as some countries have become remnants and the national state no longer exists in them. He emphasized that those who claim that the ongoing incidents are not expected to contradict themselves, adding that Egypt remains a strategic depth for every Arab country and only the ungrateful deny its role in serving the Arab issues. The Ministry of Health said last night that the total number of COVID-19 tests reached 521,101 and that 724 new cases were registered on Friday and 636 recoveries. The Ministry of Health urges everyone to adhere to the rules and affirm the importance of following instructions such as washing one's hands with soap and water on a regular basis, along with avoiding shaking hands and close contact. Moreover, covering the nose and mouth when sneezing and avoiding public places when possible. The King Abdullah bin Abdulaziz International Center for Interreligious and Intercultural Dialogue has held the first day of its preliminary sessions ahead of the conference, which is said to be held in Riyadh later this year. The Secretary General of the Center, Faisal bin Muammar, said that the conference, which will receive participants from 20 countries, is regarded a series of achievements in the field of interreligious and intercultural dialogue in Saudi Arabia, Spain, Austria and the Vatican. He added that hosting the conference in Saudi Arabia adds to the significance of the event in light of the country's leading status in the Islamic world and its political and economic weight. Bin Muammar concluded by saying that the conference will discuss issues that concern the interests of the people of the world, especially in light of the pandemic. 
The Crown Prince of the Emirate of Abu Dhabi and the Deputy Supreme Commander of the UAE Armed Forces, His Highness Sheikh Mohammed bin Zayed Al Nahyan, visited the site of the Strata manufacturing plant in Al Ain City, where parts of airplanes are produced for the world's leading airline companies as well as N95 face masks. During the visit, His Highness said that the United Arab Emirates is working on enhancing its position as a regionally and internationally significant center for the airline industry. The company witnessed an expansion in the past year, which has enabled it to produce key parts of the Boeing 787. Dreamliner aircraft as per an agreement between Strata Manufacturing and Boeing. Yemeni military sources have said that the National Army has recovered a number of positions along the front in the northern province of El Beidah. The sources said that these military accomplishments were due to its efforts as well as those of the Allied forces in support of legitimacy which surrounded Houthi positions in Hazm City in Jauf province. The media center of the Yemeni Armed Forces said that the army is in the process of engaging in battles against the Iran-backed Houthi militia for the fifth day in various areas which have resulted in significant losses among the ranks of the Houthis. In related news, the Yemeni National Army announced that it has destroyed a warehouse that belongs to the Iran-backed Houthi militia in the west of the country from which drone attacks are launched. A military statement said that the Allied forces have taken this step in retaliation against repeated breaches of the ceasefire. The statement also said that the Houthi forces that are concentrated in the Mansouri area tried to attack the army using shells, automatic weapons and drones and that these attacks have reached civilian targets along 16 kilometers which include villages and farms without any military significance. Egyptian President Abdel Fattah al-Sisi stressed that his country has a sincere desire to reach a just and balanced agreement regarding the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam, taking into consideration the interests of the downstream countries of Egypt and Sudan and not causing harm to their water rights. This came during the Egyptian President's participation in a mini-summit of heads of State of the African Union Presidency Office via video conference to discuss the Renaissance Dam issue. President al-Sisi also affirmed that Egypt has always been fully prepared to negotiate in order to secure the interests of all parties by reaching a fair and balanced agreement. He pointed out that the success of this process requires a commitment of all parties and their clear declaration of not taking any unilateral measures, including the failure to start filling the dam without developing an agreement and returning immediately to the negotiation table. The last time President Donald Trump visited Wisconsin, he staged a massive raucous rally at an arena in midtown or rather downtown Milwaukee. When he returns to the battleground state, he'll be remained reminded how much has changed since January. The Republican president planned a trip to conservative rural Wisconsin for a private tour of a shipyard far from Milwaukee where coronavirus restrictions now prevent large rallies. A day earlier, the governor activated the National Guard in the capital to protect state property from angry protests against racial injustice. When Trump last campaigned in the state in January, the unemployment rate was 3.5 percent. Now, 12 percent of Wisconsin workers are jobless. Trump's standing in Wisconsin appears to be suffering from the extraordinary period of turmoil, and his visit was part of a concerted effort to shore up support in friendlier areas that can make or break his re-election chances. The massive deal is worth up to $5.5 billion. We'll put the shipyard to work constructing some of the fastest most advanced and most maneuverable combat ships anywhere in the ocean. I hear the maneuverability is one of the big factors that you were chosen for the contract. The other is your location in Wisconsin, if you want to know the truth. This contract will support your 1,500 full-time employees, and it will also enable you to hire another 1,000 people all across the shipyards in Wisconsin. And we'll always live by two simple rules. Buy American and hire American. Buy American and hire American. Egypt lifted today many restrictions put in place against the coronavirus pandemic, reopening cafes, clubs, gyms and theatres after more than three months of closure. According to Egyptian Prime Minister Mustafa Medbouli, cafes have been allowed to reopen at only 25% seating capacity. Mosques and churches will also not be allowed to hold their weekly main services when large crowds traditionally gather for worship. The government has banned Friday's Muslim prayers at mosques and Sunday masses at churches. The government is also planning the reopening of select tourist destinations to international a charter flight starting Thursday, allowing travelers from around the world to return to parts of the country less hard hit by the virus. Those include the southern part of the Sinai Peninsula, home to the major resort and beach destination of Sharm el-Sheikh, the Red Sea resort area of Hargada and Marsa Alam, as well as Marsa Matruh on the Mediterranean coast. 
Tunisia fully reopened its borders today but kept some precautionary measures against the novel coronavirus. In a statement, Tunisia's Ministry of Health indicated that it classified people coming from countries abroad into green, orange and red categories, whereas those coming from red countries would not be subjected to anti-coronavirus medical precautions. Travelers coming to Tunisia from countries classified as orange are compelled to conduct medical examinations for the virus ahead of coming and are also obliged to sequester themselves at home. Those coming from states categorized as red are must isolate themselves at a hotel for a week in addition to another week at home. Meanwhile, the Director General of the Tunisia Airways said in a statement that the airline was ready to organize flights with precautionary measures, noting that occupancy on a single flight would not exceed 40%. India reported more than 18,000 new coronavirus cases today, pushing its cumulative total over the half-million mark. Authorities in the capital, New Delhi, have begun a door-to-door -door survey of residents to map the coronavirus spread as the city becomes the worst hit in the country. Delhi's Chief Minister Arvind Kejarwal said the surge in the number of cases after the nationwide lockdown was lifted was much higher than expected. People continued to line up outside hospitals to get tested for the virus. Some people in New Delhi blamed public behavior for the spike in the number of cases. European Union envoys are close to finalizing a list of countries whose citizens will be allowed to enter Europe again, possibly from late next week. EU diplomats confirmed today that Americans are almost certain to be excluded in the short term due to the number of U.S. coronavirus cases. Infection rates are high in Brazil, India and Russia, and it's unlikely the EU will let their citizens in either. The envoys were expected to have narrowed down the exact criteria for countries to make the list, which include the way the spread of the virus is being managed. Another key condition is whether the country has a ban on citizens from European nationals. The list would be updated every 14 days with new countries added and some possibly being let off based on how they manage the spread of the virus.